Good evening. Glad you could all be out here tonight. Uh, I'd like to talk to you tonight about whether we are following Jesus or not. I want you to think about that for a moment. What does it mean to you to follow Jesus? Think about that. When asked, most Christians would say that they are following Jesus. They would likely say that an integral part of their faith is following Jesus. Jesus or God. The problem is while most Christians say they are following Jesus, few take any action to actually do that. And we can see here from tonight with the congregation that some of them didn't take action to come here tonight to worship God. And that's part of following Jesus, right? I didn't say that as an indictment on us, but sometimes we have to really self-examine ourselves. I see that added that attitude in me sometimes. I'm quick, to, I'm quick to say I follow God, but my actions don't always show that. What I found is that it's easier to say when we are following Jesus, but it's really hard to actually do. The problem is when Jesus said, follow me, he actually meant it. He intended for us to be participants, not spectators. We are his hands and feet doing his work, not just giving lip service. You see, following Jesus means we actually have to do something. Being a Christian isn't about what we believe as much as it is the person we follow. I think it's important that we look at what is actually meant to follow Jesus and how we can put it into practice in our lives. What does the Bible say or tell us about following Jesus? Many times throughout the Gospels, we find Jesus' invitation to follow him. Sometimes this is Jesus calling his 12 disciples, and other times it's an open invitation to anyone listening. What's clear is that Jesus expects his followers to follow him. In Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And Mark 8, 34 tells us, When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Then also in Luke, 923 then he said to them all if anyone desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me and in ephesians 5 1 and 2 therefore be imitators of god as dear children and walk in love as christ also has loved us and give us given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to god for a sweet smelling aroma and then finally in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2, it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. The early church is continuing, and we are continually reminded that they are not just spectators, but they are, they have, we have a role to play in following Jesus. The Bible is constantly clear throughout the New Testament. Christians aren't defined by what they believe, rather, as I mentioned before, who we follow. Now, let's think about what's at stake if we say that we're following Jesus, but we don't follow Jesus. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. That's in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Paul tells us that we are the body of Christ. Think about that for a minute. If you are a Christian, you are, Je you are Jesus' hands and feet. You represent him to, be, to the people around you. Everyone around you, when you become a Christian and you profess to be a Christian publicly, they're going to put you under a microscope. They're going to watch you. They're going to keep an eye on you. And they're going to call you out every chance they get. There are people who don't know Jesus 
who are watching you and making assumptions about the Jesus and what he is really like. There are people around you who, whose picture of who Jesus is will be shaped by what you do and say, for better or for worse, doesn't matter. As followers of Jesus, we represent him to those around us. What we do, what we say, tells others something about God, good or bad. Following Jesus means that Jesus actually expects you to do something and there's consequences for our actions. This means that we should love how Jesus loved. Now think about that for a moment. And what that brings to my mind is when Jesus was hanging on the cross and about to give his last breath, what was the last thing he said? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's talking about people that beat him, that spat on him, that rammed the crown of thorns down on his head to where he was bleeding, uh, blood was running in his eyes, but yet he said those words. He said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What should Jesus mean to us? What should Jesus, what should we teach other people about Jesus? We should hang out with who Jesus hanged out with, hung out with. We should be followers in Jesus' footsteps. I think sometimes that we, I know I'm speaking to myself here too, sometimes that we actually forget about following Jesus. We get caught up in the in the everyday life and everything that's going on around us. We get angry at people sometimes. We say things we shouldn't say. We do things we shouldn't do. But we have to remember that every there, we're always being watched by someone. The world desperately needs a church that actually follows Jesus and lives the way Jesus lived. It needs Christians that take their name seriously. To actually be the hands and feet of Jesus. The world is hurting. People are hungry. They're oppressed. They're tired. They're lost. And sometimes they're just plain out of hope. And it's our job to go to those people. The world desperately needs a church that is following Jesus with their whole lives. The problem is we've forgotten how to follow Jesus. We've neglected to follow him. We prioritize our safety and comfort over sometimes our duty. We'd rather criticize than love. We'd rather be right than take action and keep for ourselves his gift of salvation rather than give it away. When those things become the primary driving force, we lose our effectiveness, our saltiness. And what good is salt that loses its saltiness? And that's found in Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. I use a lot of salt on my food. I know I shouldn't, but I do. I use a lot of pepper on my food too, so, but I like seasoning and I know exactly what that verse is saying. If you sprinkle the salt on and it's not salty enough, you sprinkle more on. And then you sprinkle more on. And then you sprinkle more on. Until you get it right where you want it, right? And that's what this verse is telling us. If we're not flavored with Jesus in our life, and we're not using that example that Jesus gave us in the Bible, we might as well be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Harsh, but true. We forget that we serve a God that literally became helpless in the pursuit of us. A God that willingly went to the cross to make a way for us to get back to Him. We serve a God that went through hell on our behalf. And the call of Christians is to do the same for others and that's part of following Jesus. If the primary driving force in your life is safety and comfort, you have stopped following in the footprints of Jesus. I don't say that as a, that is an attack, but I say it as a reminder. One that I know that I need as well as maybe a lot of people in this room. 
The mission of Christians is not to seek safety. It's not to pursue comfort. It is to seek and love the lost, the hurting, and the opposed. Following Jesus means being his hands and feet. And let's be honest, as a whole, the church is not known for doing that sometimes. The church is not known for following Jesus, and we've got to change that. We've got to do a better job at it. How do we follow Jesus? So, what does it mean to be his hands and his feet? I want to give you three questions to reflect on that will help you understand what this looks like. Where did Jesus go? What did Jesus do? And how did Jesus feel? Where did Jesus go? If we are supposed to be following Jesus, the first thing we should do is go where he went. So where did Jesus go? Throughout the gospel, we see Jesus in most commonly found in one of three places. Alone, often praying or resting, with his closest friends or in the community, being in the community, with the opposed, the forgotten, the sick, the sinners, and the culturally insignificant people. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list at all because Jesus was much more than those three things. Jesus went to plenty of other places in his time on earth. However, if you glance through the Gospels, you will find Jesus is often in or heading to one of these places. I find most Christians are pretty good at the second one. We're typically pretty good about spending time in the community or spending time in the Christian community together. But the other two, not so much. We downplay the need for rest and spending time with God. But Jesus prioritizes it. He would walk away from crowds that he had real need that had real needs so he could spend time with his father and rest. We need that. In a society that worships the grind and getting more and more, we need to look at that. We also struggle with going to the opposed and the forgotten. It's messy, it's dirty, and it can be a little dangerous. So we often just avoid it. We'd rather stay in our safe little community rather than venture into the unknown. But if we're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus, we sometimes need to venture into the unknown. What did Jesus do? When Jesus was with people, he gave them what they needed. Not always what they wanted, but what they ultimately needed. He sat with the sick, talked to the ignored, challenged the proud, helped the poor, gave purpose to the hopeless, comforted the distraught, and forgave the masses. In short, he showed love to everyone he came in contact with. Do we do that in our everyday lives? Just think about it for a moment. We tend to differ from Jesus in that we would rather give them what they want, not what they need. Maybe the most applicable story of this today is found in John 8, 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commands us that we should be that she should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them. Now pay attention here. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, 
Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The story of the woman caught in adultery, she was unfairly accused because the man wasn't brought, for one thing. They were supposed to be both brought, not just the woman. It was a setup, really, when you really stop and think about it. It was just a, a setup to see what Jesus was going to do. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't step in and defend her right away. He just actually just pretends like he's not paying any attention to them. I don't know what he was writing on the ground. Maybe he was writing on the ground. Maybe you guys should just walk, turn around and walk away while you're ahead. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote on there. But Jesus got in between her and her attackers. He stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with his accusers. He defended her in a bold yet nonviolent way. And don't miss this. He did it at a great risk to himself because he knew what was going to come. He knew what was going to come because he forgave her, her of her sins and that was making him God for one thing. And he didn't do what the law of Moses said and that's what they lived by to a T was the law of Moses. The reality is she wasn't totally innocent. She had some blame, but that didn't make how she was being treated okay. That didn't justify her attacker's actions. Often for us to, would we be willing to stick our neck out for someone that was in that situation? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. That I think is maybe the best example that Jesus could actually set for us to follow today is to stick up for a sinner because we are all sinners and we've all been in that position. And the problem with us as a church and the problem with us as Christians, we have levels of sin. Some are worse than others, but what does sin look like to God? all on an even keel it doesn't matter and sometimes we definitely forget that in our lives we forget that because we look at other people and we say boy look what they did look how bad that is but yet our sins are just as bad how did Jesus feel when he was talking to the woman it doesn't really tell us but I feel that he had great compassion for her she was caught in the act of adultery she was caught in her sins and he was the only person that was able to forgive her of that sin. And something that I was listening to coming in today is the guy made this comment. He said, Christianity is the only, is the only religion that actually forgives your enemies. All the other religions that have been developed, they don't forgive their enemies. They want to destroy their enemies. Christianity, we're taught to forgive our enemies. Jesus was motivated by his longing and his desire to just be with his creation. He was genuinely moved by the people he encountered. He showed his emotions, his empathy. That's one of the things that attracted people to him. He actually cared about them and what they were going through. Here's three emotions we often see him displaying. Compassion, like with the woman at the well, Grief, like facing the death of Lazarus, and anger over injustice, like flipping tables in the temple. Imagine if the church was known for these things, if we were actually known for loving and emp having empathy for everyone we come in contact with. If we cried with those grieving, another sense, senseless act of violence that were involved in a, uh, an act of violence, if we got filled with righteous anger over the injustice done to people, to kids in our country, imagine the impact, the difference the church could make if we just embodied these three emotions. If the church were just known for following Jesus, our impact would drastically increase. Our call always, not just tonight, but our call always is to follow Jesus. 
to be his hands and his feet. We need to go where he went, do what he did, and feel what he felt. When we do that, we are following Jesus. If we call ourselves Christians, we need to ask ourselves, are we following Jesus? Are we actually following in his footsteps? This week, I want you to prayerfully think and ponder on the questions I ask here in this sermon. And look at the direction that our lives are heading. Who are we really following? Jesus ex expects, he actually expects us, his followers, to be his hands and feet. And how can we do that? We need to think about ways this coming week how we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. He expects us to get in the game. The question is, for us is, how will we respond? If you have a need tonight to be baptized, we can do that for you. Or if you have a need to come back to the Lord, please take care of it tonight. We can pray with you. Please come as we stand and sing.